As the U.S. Attorney for the District, I lead an office with an incredibly diverse set of responsibilities. No responsibility, though, is greater than our responsibility to keep the community safe. The thousands of cases we have charged for violations of D.C. code or federal offenses and the numerous investigations into violent crime that we are leading reflect how seriously we take this responsibility. Today, I want to talk about one very specific aspect of our work, how we handle arrests for D.C. code offenses at the time of arrest. The U.S. Attorney's Office continues to charge at the time of arrest approximately 90 percent of the most serious violent felony offenses. I can also report that currently nearly 60 percent of all arrests for D.C. code offenses are being charged by us at the time of arrest or transferred to the D.C. Office of Attorney General for prosecution. This is a substantial increase from where the office stood in October 2021 at the start of the last fiscal year. The increase is largely explained by how our office and the mayor's office worked together to find a solution to an unprecedented crisis that occurred in April 2021 when the District Department of Forensic Sciences lost its accreditation. With that loss of accreditation, the district lost the ability to confirm that a substance law enforcement suspected was a drug was, in fact, a drug, which meant that we lost the ability to charge almost all drug cases. Our office secured help from the Drug Enforcement Administration in March 2022 to test drugs in the most serious cases, and the mayor's office secured an outside laboratory to conduct testing for all their drug arrests in May 2023. That means that the only period when we had all of the drug testing we needed was the fourth quarter of fiscal year 2023, July 1st through September 30th, 2023. So while the charging rate for the entire fiscal year was 44%, during the fourth quarter, we charged 53% of arrests in Superior Court, and we transferred roughly 5% of arrests for prosecution by our office in U.S. District Court or by the D.C. Office of the Attorney General. These numbers are an accurate reflection of where things currently stand, a 58% day of arrest prosecution rate. The roughly four in 10 arrests that are currently not being charged at the time of arrest break down as follows. In about one in five of all arrests, the victim does not want to participate or proceed and we respect their wishes. This is the most common reason for not going forward and it represents roughly half of the cases here we are not charging at the time of arrest. In approximately 13% of arrests, our office lacks sufficient evidence to charge at the time of arrest. In about 3% of arrests, our office believes the arrested individual has a valid affirmative defense, such as self-defense. In the remaining 7% of arrests, our office exercises its prosecutorial discretion and chooses not to charge an arrest. Most of these arrests are low-level misdemeanors committed by individuals with no or limited criminal history. We can discuss where improvements are needed and where improvements are not needed, but must remember that there is no public safety benefit to flooding the judicial system with cases that will ultimately be dismissed because of evidentiary or witness problems. First, we do not need to bring more cases over the objections of victims. I want to be clear that we do not need a victim's consent to proceed, and we already charge hundreds of cases over the objection of victims, particularly in serious felonies where we believe the arrested individual poses a threat. But a victim's views are very significant to us, especially when the victim's testimony would be essential to our prosecution, which is usually the case, and the penalties a defendant would face if convicted are low. If a victim would be an essential witness, and we elect to proceed over the victim's objections, we are effectively saying we are prepared to subpoena the victim to testify at trial and arrest the victim should the victim not comply with the subpoena. That is not a step we take lightly, and we will do it only when we are convinced that the safety of the community outweighs the victim's view of what is in his or her best interest. The roughly one in five arrests where we do not compel victims to participate in the criminal justice system are almost all misdemeanors and cases where we do not believe we need to prosecute the arrested individual to protect the community. If you're wondering, how is it that in roughly one in five arrests, we have a victim who asks us not to proceed or who is uncooperative with the investigation, 
The answer is that we have a strict domestic violence law that requires MPD to arrest anyone they have a probable cause to arrest when called to a domestic dispute. And the law defines domestic disputes broadly. It's not just intimate partners, but also parents and their children, or even siblings. The law requires MPD to arrest even when the criminal conduct is limited to a push or damaging a cell phone, even when no one including MPD thinks an arrest is the appropriate outcome of a minor dispute, even when there are no injuries and no prior violence, and even when both parties have a valid claim of self-defense. We are in the minority of jurisdictions in the country to have such a law, and our law is among the least forgiving of any such law in the country. There are many important policy reasons to have such a law and to ask prosecutors to take a second look at all domestic violence incidents. But there is no doubt that this law is a big reason why, even back in 2016, we were declining over 30% of arrests. Second, there will always be some small percentage of cases where an arrested individual has a valid legal defense, like self-defense. To be clear, we continue to charge and aggressively prosecute hundreds of cases a year where the defendant is claiming self-defense as a justification for the crime. However, in our assessment, the evidence does not support that claim. The cases we decline to charge are the ones where we essentially credit the defense. Third, the roughly 7% of cases where we are exercising our discretion do not present a public safety concern. Almost all of them are low-level misdemeanors where we have determined that the offense is so minimal that they do not warrant criminal prosecution. For example, one such arrest was an individual whose credit card was declined after he ordered a sandwich and a drink and who had no other form of payment and was arrested for theft of services. Another was an individual who was arrested for simple assault after throwing their food at someone's back. Yet another was an individual who slammed their hand on a police car hood and was charged with a felony for doing so. We do not see the societal interest in prosecuting cases like these and the others in this category, and we know how our judges and juries would react if we charge such cases. At the end of the day, prosecuting these arrests would not reduce the shootings, carjackings, and robberies that are of greatest concerns to our community. This brings me to an important category of cases not charged at the time of arrest. The 13% of cases where we cannot go forward simply because we lack the evidence we need. For a variety of reasons, it may be that we will continue to see cases like these that we cannot charge at the time of arrest. The majority of these arrests are misdemeanors. We need to shift the dialogue from overall charging numbers to arrests in this category that involve firearms and violent crimes. The good news is that for many of the firearms and violent crime cases in this category, we have a demonstrated process for continuing to investigate these cases where there is a possibility of developing additional evidence. If we develop sufficient evidence, we routinely charge such cases. Even though the person is ultimately charged, these arrests will always appear as declinations in our day of arrest charging rates. The nature of many of these firearms offenses and violent crimes is that there may be enough evidence to arrest, but not enough evidence to charge. Know that we are committed to continuing to work with MPD and other law enforcement partners to make the arrest the beginning of the story in these circumstances, not the end of it. When I talk about our work to keep the community safe, I must also talk about the work we are doing to target those whom we believe to be driving violence in our community. When I started in the role early in fiscal year 2022, one thing that I consistently heard from MPD and our federal law enforcement partners was that they wanted our office to charge more of our most violent offenders with violations of federal law in district court. That's because we see more violent offenders detained pending trial in district court, a higher rate of conviction in district court, and greater prison sentences in district court than we do when we prosecute local crimes in superior court. We have increased the number of drug, firearm, and violent crime prosecutions we bring in district court by almost 60%. My vision was to prosecute the people who are driving gun violence in our community in district court so we can remove them from our community and give the neighborhoods they terrorize time to heal. We will continue to look at charging rates to determine where improvements can be made. But focusing on overall charging rates, particularly the thousands of arrests every year for misdemeanor offenses where the victims do not want to proceed is not a strategy for dealing with violent crime. I do not intend to start charging cases we know we cannot prove just for the sake of reporting higher charging rates. 
That is not a strategy to address the crime crisis in our city. To the contrary, it diverts our resources away from addressing that crisis. On that front, know that I am in constant contact with our federal and local law enforcement partners on addressing what is happening in our community. We had a horrific summer. While there are some signs of improvement, it is not enough. Our prosecutorial efforts are a necessary part of the equation, but prosecution alone is not sufficient. It is going to take the entire criminal justice system to address these issues, and we will do everything in our power to play our part. I can assure you that our office will continue to use every available tool in combating the violent crime crisis we are experiencing in our city. This includes continuing to charge at arrest approximately 90% of our most serious violent felonies. This includes prosecuting as adults those 16 and 17 year olds who are committing pattern or spree armed robberies and carjackings. This includes bringing federal charges against those individuals driving gun violence and coordinating with our federal law enforcement partners in conducting large scale takedowns in communities being ravaged by violence. We will do everything we can to relentlessly attack them from our lane. One shooting is one too many, one carjacking is one too many, one robbery is one too many. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message.